My dad's as brave as a dad can be. I rate him number one. He is not afraid of the dead of night or anything under the sun. He is not afraid of a late night film full of horrors on the telly. And is he afraid of skeletons? Not dead, not on your nelly. He's not afraid of meeting ghosts. He would even smile and greet them. And things that scare most dads the most, my dad could just defeat them. He's not afraid of vampires or a wolfman come to get him. If Frankenstein's monster knocked on our door, he wouldn't let that upset him. My dad's as brave as a dad can be. And he's always ready to prove it. So why, when a spider's in the bath, does mom have to come and remove it? Poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital reason of existence. That was a line from Andre Lorry's poem. She's a black feminist poet. But what I want to focus on is the poet aspect. I am a poet. A poet is someone who writes poetry. Poetry is words that flow and rhyme together in such a way that it can convey a feeling or just explaining the poet's experience. Growing up, I didn't have many friends or family members near me or even movies at the time. I know I had Disney books instead of the Disney movies, and reading is essential to writing, so I would always read and buy notebooks and fill each page with either art, lyrics, or poetry. Growing up, middle school, elementary school, I got bullied. I didn't really have friends, I sat in the back of classes, I would eat in those classrooms afterwards, but I had music and poetry. I would write how I felt, I would express myself, even if it was like the slightest thought in my brain, like I wanna go home right now, or I hope my teacher is sick, it still gave me a reason to keep going. It gave me purpose, even when I thought it didn't sometimes. When I got a little older, about my preteens, 13, 14, I was really depressed and I had really no outlet. And I didn't see poetry as an outlet at, at that moment. And so I wrote something really deep about hurting myself. And I realized poetry was therapeutic. I didn't need to hurt myself because I had poetry there to listen to my pain and listen to what I'm going through. And with poetry, you can ask questions to yourself or others. You can answer them or not answer them and they're still therapeutic and expressive. Poetry was my hero. It kept me going, and now it's my second major. Poetry gives a name to the nameless, so they can be thought. What do Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo all have in common with the heroes of ancient myths? What if I told you they are all variants of the same hero? Do you believe that? Joseph Campbell did. He studied myths from all over the world and published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, retelling dozens of stories and explaining how each represents the monomyth or hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? Think of it as a cycle. The journey begins and ends in the hero's ordinary world, but the quest passes through an unfamiliar, special world. Along the way, there are some key events. Think about your favorite book or movie. Does it follow this pattern? Status quo, that's where we start. One o'clock, call to adventure. 
the hero receives a mysterious message. An invitation? A challenge? Two o'clock. Assistance. The hero needs some help. Probably from someone older, wiser. Three o'clock. Departure. The hero crosses the threshold from his normal, safe home and enters the special world and adventure. We're not in Kansas anymore. Four o'clock. Trials. Being a hero is hard work. Our hero solves a riddle, slays a monster, escapes from a trap. Five o'clock. Approach. It's time to face the biggest ordeal, the hero's worst fear. Six o'clock. Crisis. This is the hero's darkest hour. He faces death and possibly even dies, only to be reborn. Seven o'clock. Treasure. As a result, the hero claims some treasure, special recognition, or power. Eight o'clock, result. This can vary between stories. Do the monsters bow down before the hero, or do they chase him as he flees from the special world? Nine o'clock, return. After all that adventure, the hero returns to his ordinary world. 10 o'clock, new life. This quest has changed the hero. He has outgrown his old life. 11 o'clock, resolution. All the tangled plot lines get straightened out. 12 o'clock, status quo, but upgraded to a new level. Nothing is quite the same once you're a hero. Many popular books and movies follow this ancient formula pretty closely, but let's see how well The Hunger Games fits the hero's journey template. When does Katniss Everdeen hear a call to adventure that gets the story moving? When her sister's name is called from the lottery? How about assistance? Is anyone going to help her on her adventure? Hey, Mitch. What about departure? Does she leave her ordinary world? She gets on a train to the capital. Okay, so you get the idea. What do you have in common with Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo? Well, you're human, just like them. The hero's journey myth exists in all human cultures and keeps getting updated because we humans reflect on our world through symbolic stories of our own lives. You leave your comfort zone, have an experience that transforms you, and then you recover and do it again. You don't literally slay dragons or fight Voldemort, but you face problems just as scary. Joseph Campbell said, in the cave you fear to enter lies the treasure you seek. What is the symbolic cave you fear to enter? Auditions for the school play? Baseball tryouts? Love? Watch for this formula in books, movies, and TV shows you come across. You will certainly see it again, but also be sensitive to it in your own life. Listen for your call to adventure. Accept the challenge. Conquer your fear and claim the treasure you seek. And then do it all over again. Jack fell as he'd have wished, the mother said, and folded up the letter that she'd read. The colonel writes home nicely. Something broke in the tired voice that quavered to a choke. She half looked up. We mothers are so proud of our dead soldiers. Then her face was bowed. Quietly the brother officer went out. He'd told the poor old dear some gallant lies that she would nourish all her days, no doubt. For a while he coughed and mumbled her weak eyes had shone with gentle triumph, brimmed with joy, because he'd been so brave, her glorious boy. He thought how Jack, cold-footed, useless swine, had panicked down the trench that night the mine went up at Wicked Corner. 
how he'd tried to get sent home and how at last he died blown to small bits and no one seemed to care except that lonely woman with white hair.